All right, so um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce Jesse Williams um, from our esteemed host committee. He'll be chairing this session where the rubber meets the road. Jesse. Thanks, Aaron. Good afternoon. I'm Jesse with Jacobs. We have a fantastic panel. Um, I'd ask them to prepare a very long bio. We were talking about like favorite ice cream and pet stories and all sorts of stuff, but they've got really great presentations. So I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to read all the bios somewhat quickly. And if you've got questions about their details, find them at happy hour. Um, Eli Makowitz, you can correct, correct my pronunciation later if it, okay, as have I. Um, Eli has spent the last 15 years managing residential and neighborhood scale stormwater improvement projects for the city of Bellingham, um, Bellingham, Washington. Eli serves as the city's subject expert and technical lead on stormwater retrofits, uh, watershed planning, and structural pollutant controls. Um, and I'm just going to do the whole group here. Madison Bristol with Oh, excuse me, Madison Rose Bristol with Ecology uh, represents the Washington Department of Ecology and is one of the agency's lead planners on addressing six PPDQ. Um, in their position, they facilitate collaborative efforts between ecology and tribal governments, state and federal agencies, research groups, and local to national interest groups. As a stormwater planner, they're also responsible for allocating funding for stormwater best management practices or BMPs, effectiveness, effectiveness studies, and monitoring contracts. Uh, Rhea Smith is a natural resource scientist also at, at Ecology. Uh, she's She's born and raised in the Salish Sea watershed with, with over 20 years of experience in aquatic science. She specializes in developing strategies to detect spatial and temporal anthropogenic changes to aquatic environments. Awesome. I think I actually said that right. That was, yeah. Um, well, it, it really keeps going here, but she's got some really great data on, on uh, six, six PBDQ. Uh, Christian Nielsen is a surface water hydrologist with over 20 years of experience in the fields of stormwater, water quality, and watershed planning. He's currently the Western Washington Surface Water Practice Manager at Geosyntech Consultants, where he has overseen the development of numerous watershed management plans for various local, state, and federal clients. And last but not least, Sean Dixon is the executive director of Puget Sound Keeper, an organization founded in 1984 with a mission to protect and enhance the waters of Puget Sound for the health and restoration of our aquatic ecosystems and the communities that depend on them. Prior to joining Soundkeeper in 2021, John worked as the chief of staff at Region 1, New England office of the US EPA, and as senior attorney at Hudson Riverkeeper in New York City. And he's got some really great stuff. Again, happy hour. So without further ado, I'm going to call up Eli. Oh, and we're going to hold questions until the end, please. Okay, Eli. All right, Green Infrastructure Summit. It's wonderful to be here. Following our wills and wins, we may just go where no one's been. Let's try. Um, hi, I'm Eli. I'm from Bellingham, but enough about me. I'm here to talk to you today about 6PPDQ, the reason you're all sitting in this room here right now. Um, if uh, I, I'm here to speak on behalf of the 6PPDQ subgroup of the Stormwater Work Group, which is a diverse group of stakeholders that have been meeting over the past 36 months. But I do work in Belling and for Bellingham. I live in Bellingham. That phone number and email will reach me in Bellingham, but I'm not speaking on behalf of my municipality today. If I happen to say something that sounds like I'm speaking on behalf of Bellingham, 
That's my cantankerous twin Levi trying to get me in trouble. The difference is he wears contacts, but sometimes he puts on glasses just to get me in trouble. So I'm gonna to try to stick to the big picture here today. Um, so before I put together this presentation and actually uh, somewhere around 18 months ago, I was asked by a communications team to describe this problem, uh, the situation we're in using only icons that are provided free in PowerPoint. So this is my effort at that. So what happened was we took water off of a bridge and we put fish in them for four hours and half the fish died. Then we took that same water and we put fish in them for 24 hours and they all died, 100% of them, all of them. This is Jen McIntyre's work. You all know this. You've been looking at this for five, 10, 15 years already now. What we did after that was take groundwater, uh, water that didn't come off a bridge. We put the fish in there for, a, for 24 hours and they all live. So there's something about that bridge water that's causing the issue. And in the end, we took that bridge water, we ran it through soil-like media and we put the fish in there for 72 hours and they all live. So did we solve the problem? No, but do we have a good idea of how to solve the problem? Maybe. I would also point out though, that that media that reduces six PPDQ might add copper. So it's not too, too exciting. Um, but we had this issue of coho pre-spawn mortality. And as human beings, we, had the, uh, we have the tendency to try to figure out what's going wrong immediately based on how it feels or how it looks. So we saw fish dying in the stream and people were yelling, oh, it's a disease. Oh, it's the stress of us being around. Oh, it's a poison, it's a toxin, or it's none of those. And we had to go through, we, all of us here, had to go through the process of weeding out what isn't fact to get to the reality. And in the end, we found out it was poisoning. It was stormwater poisoning from those bridges. And once we knew that, we could name this what it really is. It's not the coho dying in the stream that's the problem. It's the urban runoff killing them that is the problem. So once we realize what that, that we solved this, we've been responsible with their scientific inquiry, we found the poison, six phenol, phenol diamine quinone, and the fact that I could say that three times fast is the only reason I was voluntold to lead this committee. But really that is the poison that we're dealing with. And you all know what's been happening with this issue, uh, but then we hit the pandemic and maybe a lot of us got disconnected or we weren't involved in the science or we weren't in these kind of meetings to hear about this stuff. So what we did was put together a group, all digital, all virtual, to try to come to some understanding about what do we do next? So all these lines of inquiry you see up here are all the questions people are asking about 6PPD from can we just get rid of the tires and solve the problem on the left? Not anything that I'm involved with at all. Uh, all the way over to the stuff on the far right, which is where the 6PPDQ subgroup gets involved, looking at how do we deal with stormwater, the source of tire wear particles, and the tire wear particles that end up in the rivers and streams that become 6PPDQ. So on one side, the stormwater managers are worried about tire rubber. On the other side, habitat managers are worried about uh, the, the concentration of 6PPDQ in habitats that were trying so hard to restore and we build an ecological trap and fish come in there and then they die in our beautiful new habitat. So our 6PPDQ subgroup um, on this, I, I couldn't figure out how to make this go long enough to cover everybody. So it's just gonna give you about 60 names now, but we had more than 800 people come to our 6PPDQ work groups from more than 300 organizations from everywhere from the tire industry to, I wanna thank Bridget for correcting or giving me the right language here. It's not only tribal representatives, but native and indigenous peoples who came to our group to try to learn as a round table, not a top down uh, uh, um, dictate of here's me, Eli, the six PPDQ expert, and I'm gonna tell everybody what they need to do. This was a group that got together for the purpose of trying to understand the problem. And one thing I also picked up on this morning is that we are trying to solve the problem from the simulator point of view to say, of course, we came here and then the environment got screwed up. That's what happens. That's what happens when humans go places. And our tribal folks, our friends from the tribe said, no, that's not what happens when human gets places. That's what happens when you Europeans get places. And that's true. 
We need to recognize this and be realistic. So what did we do in this group? This is I'll get boring and I'll use all the slide I can here, but basically we looked at two major issues. One is the stormwater side, the chemistry side. Um, our, our friends from Washington State University and UW Tacoma, these are the people who discovered the problem. These are the innovators who are coming up with the solutions for the stormwater issues. This isn't just, hey, you're the public works director of some big place, come tell us what, what we should do, or you're the funder with a whole bunch of money in your pocket, come tell us what to spend the money on. These are people coming together to try to answer these questions that, that you can read here that we still don't have a good answer to, but we're closer. Um, so this study on the right is one of a product that came from this effort. It's not from the six PPD subgroup, although we covered it and we presented on it in, de in depth. This is a stormwater management manual for six PPDQ basically. It tells you, look at all, all the stormwater management strategies, what might work, what might not work, what definitely won't work, and giving us a framework to move forward to study this stuff, to, to take these people smarter than me, to do things better than I can with the information. That's the purpose of the subgroup. Secondly, we looked at, well, where is it important to deal with 6PPDQ? If we only had $1 or we can only do one project or we can only protect one waterway, that, that would be terrible. Um, I, that, would be, that would be a disappointment. But if we could, where would we have to prioritize? And we asked the experts, we didn't just assume. So that table over there might not be easy to see, but it's it's, 40 experts in the geography of salmon saying, where should you stormwater managers care? Not where is your biggest pipe or where is your biggest complaint from your public or where's the flooding the worst, but where should you focus? And what they told us is you focus on your local roads that are high in traffic. Yes, you can look at the highway, you can point at the highway, you can point at that, you can point at that. Focus on your local roads that are high traffic. And second, focus on all the areas that drain to those habitats that you're building, all those restoration and fish passage projects you do, make sure that those projects are protected from 6PPDQ after you're done. This is the guidance that we got as a group to try to answer these questions. And then we move forward. Um, our 6PPD subgroup is uh, winding down. We're still meeting quarterly. But this report on the right is probably something you have all seen today. If you haven't, I, I, um, I have a copy and we should, we should get it out broadly, but it is a good summary of the entire 6PPDQ issue um, in more than stormwater. And we're talking now about holding accountable the people in the world that are getting answers to these questions for us. So if it's our money that's being used for studies, it's a study answering the right question so that we can solve this issue. Um, and this, so the 6PPD subgroup will continue, but in a limited capacity, most of our work is done. And what was our work, you'll, you'll ask? Well, this is my last slide. Um, we made recommendations to a bunch of different people out there. We said, here are our unanswered questions. We pulled together 800 people. We talked about this. Here's what we recommend. And you can read the recommendations up there. It's a lot from everybody and, and all walks of life. There might be something up there for you to think about and for you to be studying. But as that folks have noticed, we need a massive treasure. Uh, we need a lot of money to get this work done. And uh, money's got to come from somewhere. We also need brain power. Um, we need people smarter than me doing things better than I can with this information. Um, and we need to, to look at the hardest, most difficult problems and challenges first. And finally, uh, noted, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, I, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. It seems daunting, uh, but if we don't start, we can never finish. And, and I would just, um, I'm gonna hand off this presentation to the Department of Ecology to carry on um, to talk about what is going to happen next in the planning. Um, but I just wanna recognize uh, everybody here who's been part of this uh, that, that brought us here I did my job at all. You know as much as I do now about how to take on this work. And I hope that you go forward and do it. Thank you, that's, that's all I've got today. Shall I stand right here? There we go. Hi, I'm Madison Rose Bristol. I'm with the Washington Department of Ecology. 
I am their 6PPDQ stormwater planner. Um, I started in December of 2022. So it's been really exciting to dive deep into this topic um, that is of so much importance to so many people. So that's been incredibly exciting. I am joined here today by my colleagues, Christian Nielsen of Geosyntech Solutions, um, who will be speaking after me, as well as Rhea Smith, who works for the Department of Ecology, um, who will be on the panel to answer questions about mapping and field methods related to 6PPDQ. So to ground us just a little bit more, because Eli, Eli did a great job in grounding, that was fantastic. Um, but to show sort of the two chemicals that we're working with today um, that are related to this issue, the first of which is 6PPD. So that is what is in tires themselves. And this chemical was designed to interact with ozone in the environment. But when it does that, it creates these transformation products. Um, there's a few of them, but the one that is really of concern is 6-PPD quinone. And this was discovered in 2020. 6-PPD has been added to tires since the 1960s, and observations of fish mortality has potentially been happening since the 1980s and earlier. So this has been a long time coming, and ever since we finally identified exactly what is in the stormwater that is causing these issues, there's there's been a lot of momentum that has happened. So today I'm gonna to give really an overview of the Department of Ecology's multi-part approach to dealing with this problem. So the first is reducing sources of 6PPD in tires themselves and evaluating alternatives, figuring out what we can put in tires um, that will not be just as toxic because we don't wanna exacerbate the problem in that way for sure. That's not gonna to happen tomorrow though. So what we need to do in the meantime to, to stop the harm on the ground from continuing to happen is implementing what we're all here for today, green infrastructure or stormwater best management practices as we often call it in ecology. So these are really things on the ground that can make a difference and have been proven to make a difference, but there are still so many data gaps for figuring out um, what exactly we should be doing. And then lastly, mapping and assessing to support planning. This is really important because this helps us figure out where we should be prioritizing actions. Um, what areas do we really, really care about? And what issues do we really care about? And where can we put resources right now um, to potentially create co-benefits for communities and to support um, tribal sovereignty and really address environmental justice on the ground when we are thinking about 6PPDQ? Underpinning all of this um, are collaborative efforts. So Eli has shared one of these collaborative efforts, which is the Stormwater Workgroup 6PPD subgroup. And there are a variety of other collaborations that some of them have been ongoing and some are just kicking off. Some of them are nationwide. Some of them focus on specific subjects. Um, ecology is actively engaged in tribal engagement one-on-one -on -one and through the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Um, there's also efforts between different agencies to coordinate all of these efforts um, and make sure that we're not duplicating work. And if we are, we're really adding on to the information that we need to know. So if any of you are interested in getting plugged into this and are not yet, you can reach out to me and I can likely figure out where amongst all of these collaborations uh, I can, you can fit in. So to begin with ecology's actions, we have source reduction. So this is reducing the source of 6PPD in tires. And so far what has happened is a hazards assessment and developing hazard criteria. Um, so assessing all of the possible alternatives that we could put in tires to 6PPD, and then developing criteria for the acceptable level of a hazard that those um, chemicals potentially have. We still need to do the work of filling so many data gaps, um, doing an alternative assessment of other possible alternatives, and also developing a chemical action plan for the agency um, to propel action forward. This slide shows kind of what the green screen results or the hazard assessment looks like and the different chemicals that are being assessed from 6PPD uh, to 7PPD to 7.7PD, all, all of these different chemicals. And the BM1s, we know these are toxic. These, these are not acceptable alternatives to 6PPD. The BM2s are okay, but we should really be looking at different substitutes. And anything three and above, those are really the ideal ones. 
But then it gets complicated because do they actually function like they should be functioning in the tires? And that's the question that's kind of being asked now is if they're not toxic, well, do they actually work? The other branch is stormwater management. And this is really my, my vein of expertise in stormwater planning. For stormwater best management practices, these are really what help prevent or reduce pollutants from entering Washington's waterways and causing harm. And Eli showed the BMP's effectiveness report, which was published. And one thing that's really assuring from some of the research that has come out is that the current practices on the ground um, that are already required by the permits for new and redevelopment, a lot of them, they really do work. But now the challenge moving forward is how do we scale this up um, to meet the problem at such a giant scale and affecting almost all of our transportation infrastructure and also filling those data gaps for what works, what doesn't work, and also understanding why do some of these um, stormwater best management practices work. We don't know if the chemical 6-PPDQ is transforming into something else. We don't know if it's binding with materials. We're actively trying to figure out all of these different questions. A key piece of the stormwater puzzle is with funding. Um, so something that we've been doing, we were able to double our grant funding capacities to permittees um, this year, which is great. And so that supports um, permittees and municipalities implementing on the ground solutions. We also, uh, some ongoing funding that has happened and we're, we're trying to keep it going is for BMP's effectiveness research. So we got $1.5 million from the legislature in the last biennium, and we're asking for that same amount for the next four years to both continue studies on which BMPs are effective or not, as well as um, bring in some more projects and different projects of different kinds. And because we're actively designing the solicitation process, we're really thinking of, of how do we center equity in this process, the solicit solicitation process, in this competitive grant proposal process. Very complex, and we've got a lot of questions when we sort of dive into that arena. Another thing we're doing with funding is because this is an issue of tribal sovereignty, um, we're trying to compile funding sources that are relevant to the tribes, both within ecology and beyond ecology, and seeing if that can be helpful for on the ground efforts. The last arena in ecology is mapping and assessment and different kinds of science to support planning. Christian's gonna talk about this a bit more, so I'm gonna go through a broad overview. For mapping efforts, we've got everything from GIS and developing GIS layers um, to monitoring the impacts on the ground in watersheds. This image shows some of how there's so many different layers that you could add on top of this issue to really inform um, planning from salmon and habitat distribution to integrating the environmental health disparities map from the Washington Department of Health, as well as different community impacts. This just shows another um, aspect of mapping, which is there's a lot of variability and this variability um, differs in different regions, areas, whatever subjects we are interested in. And that adds a layer of complexity. And so really when the BMPs are being implemented, mapping can also be very helpful um, for implementing site-specific solutions, different combinations of green infrastructure and BMP practices that can really help resolve this in a site-specific way. Combining mapping as well as analytical methods, um, another aspect of this problem that's really interesting is the fact that it affects species quite differently. This diagram right here um, shows coho salmon, which is the box that is um, up on the top that is all circled. Coho salmon are very closely related to Chinook salmon. However, very, very different responses. Coho salmon, there's a lot of mortality. Chinook salmon, they're mostly fine. So we don't know exactly what is going on with that. So we're actively exploring through mapping. Um, are there differences in exposure that are causing these different results? Um, coho tend to live in smaller streams in urban watersheds. Maybe that's causing them to be more exposed to this chemical. It could also be physiology, and Jen McIntyre is doing some really interesting research on this right now, seeing if there's some physiological aspects of these species that are causing these differences. 
And of course, this, this problem isn't just about salmon. Salmon are a really important piece of this, and they're really the species that told us that we need to pay attention. Um, but this is potentially affecting uh, fish also in this diagram. Rainbow trout are also affected and other aquatic organisms. And there's active research being done on human health concerns as well. And lastly, analytical methods development. We need to make sure that the data that we are collecting to understand the problem is reliable and repeatable across studies so we can actually understand the problem. Um, and we've developed some laboratory methods for sampling in water and streams, as well as field methods um, to make sure that our information is good in informing management decisions. So to wrap this up, grounding us again, why is this important? has very important implications for tribal sovereignty, tribal treaty rights, and the intertwined nature of the tribes with the salmons. We also have environmental justice concerns and in thinking about retrofits and where those retrofits are, as well as redevelopment. We're thinking about potential co-benefits to communities. We're thinking about potentially reducing harm in communities as, as well, who have been historically overburdened with pollution already. This also has implications for commercial, recreational, and subsistence fisheries. This includes salmon, as well as other fish, potentially. We have ecosystem health and resilience, and thinking about salmon specifically, since they are a keystone species and they support the entire well-being of the ecosystem, this somewhat ties into climate change and climate resilience and how uh, we need resilient ecosystems in order to step into this, this future. And then lastly, human health. There's a lot of questions with this one, and there's some active research going on, um, and we're learning more every day. So lastly, some challenges for us at the Department of Ecology in doing this kind of work, filling knowledge gaps. There's so many knowledge gaps, and we need to know which knowledge gaps are really most important to fill and what we should be pursuing. And then implementing solutions amidst uncertainty. Um, we are doing adaptive management here, basically, where we don't know everything and where we're learning new information quite literally every single day. And we're trying to integrate it into our planning to make the best informed decisions. So with that, um, I have my contact information right there, Madison, as well as the agency lead for 6PBDQ, Tanya Williams. I would be so happy to connect with any of you as this is an ongoing collaborative effort, and we really want to make things happen. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Oh, this is not mine. Let's see. I'm just giving everyone, I'm running through everyone else's slides. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I was gonna go off script anyway, so uh, let me do that. Um, my name is Christian Nilsson. I'm with Geosync Tech Consultants. Um, I served on the mapping subcommittee uh, with Ecology. And, um, you know, since my slides aren't available, I'm just gonna take this time to reflect on this conference. Um, it's been a very enjoyable conference for me. Thank you to the organizers and um, thank you to everyone who's presented so far. You know, one theme that I'm, I'm getting from this conference is the, the power of place. And everyone's been able to really talk about the places that are important to them. And I really appreciate the tribal members, starting with the centering of the, of, of the places that are important to us. And, and I love maps too. I was on the mapping subcommittee. I love this map, really describing how important locations are. Uh, as the previous speakers talked about funding 6PPD, one thing is apparent is that we have a limited amount of, of money to spend. And really the choices of, of what we're gonna fund are really choices about locations, choices of where things are gonna be. And that's what's powerful about this prioritization process is really looking at what sub-basins are most important and, and how are we going to, um, to make those decisions. Uh, I was involved with the Nature Conservancy stormwater heat map, uh, which um, TNC talked about earlier. And that's really, uh, for me, a really exciting effort because it takes, the data, the information that we um, that uh, is being collected about pollutants like 6PPD and really translating them into things like maps and showing the, the spaces and the locations that are most important. And I think that that's, if we can 
take away anything from this is uh, decisions about funding are really decisions about places. And part of what's so important about um, doing this type of work is first starting with the expertise for, for engineers and, and folks like me, but then also allowing the experts to, um, to get out of the way a little bit towards the decision-making process. Because those decisions about place, as we've heard today, are, are just so important uh, to the local communities. And so, um, sorry about the blank slides, but um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And if we ever do find those slides, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll present them. But I just want to say thank you uh, to this group. And if you do get a chance to check out the college's report, they we've done some really good um, uh, work to really map out those places. And I, I think if we walk away from this, we can, um, we can fund projects and fix the problems where they're really needed most. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Dixon. I'm executive director at Puget Soundkeeper. Uh, and I want to start out by I think talking a little bit about the framing that we were asked to, to uh, reflect upon for this conference, to talk about you know, challenging norms, challenging how we approach problems. And I'll start by saying that I fundamentally disagree with the idea that anything less than coexisting everywhere is acceptable. I think that that's something that we can achieve. We just need to work towards it through our legal systems, through our economies, through collaboration. And I think that everybody here is playing a role in that right now. And every single one of you is doing something fantastic for the world around you today. And all of that is additive. So thank you to all of you for being here and doing all of that work in every one of your communities. Give yourselves a round of applause. Now, give yourselves a round of applause like you love the fact that you're saving the world around you and you're trying to make the world better for everybody around here. Thank you. And we'll hear later if the people on Zoom did that little clap thing that we, we see from those folks. Um, but in part of the reflection for this is this question of money keeps coming up. And where do we get our money? And how does that affect our decision making? How does that affect where we're working and what we're working on? And what we have today, I think, is very, very challenging. It's unfortunate. And it's, it's, it's too much of an old style of thinking of, of systems and patriarchy and money and financing and what we're allowed to do. So right now, every single one of you has pilot programs, initiatives, mapping measures, and things I've heard 10 different times today already. Well, a whole bunch of money just became available. Maybe we can go after it. You know, maybe we can take advantage of that. Um, that is waiting for money at the top to trickle down into the programs that need it. That is not a recipe for success. A recipe for success is what money do we need to solve this problem and over what time scales and how do we start breaking that down into something that we can actually achieve and how we can achieve it together? What is that big picture goal and how do we get there together? And that's an important flipping of the script of how all this stuff works that leads a little bit into the conversation of law and regulations and how we plan our systems. Uh, you know, this is something that, that if you haven't seen already, I apologize that I took a screenshot so it's a little, little bit less grainy than I would, or a little more grainy than I would like it to be. But 6-PVD quinone is very, very, very toxic. It's the number two most toxic thing to aquatic life known to humankind, just in case that was missed in earlier presentations. It's very, very toxic. The number one here, if you touch the number one thing here, you should probably go to the hospital really quickly. So it's really, really bad. And it's been bad for a long time, as we heard. It's something we've known about. We've known that stormwater toxicity kills our aquatic ecosystems for a long time. We've known that green infrastructure helps for a long time. We've known that we only have two minutes left in this presentation for just about 12 seconds. So, you know, we, the system is very complex. This is from the governor's salmon report. Uh, the things affecting salmon are, there's myriad impacts of salmon from climate change to habitat loss and toxic stormwater. Salmon aren't doing well anywhere, pretty much. Um, we have uh, a bunch of endangered species and populations throughout the sound apparently have 10 minutes or two minutes. I think there's community time, so I'm getting mixed messages here. So I'll keep flying through. We know that stormwater is uh, leading to 
minutes. Yeah. Listen to them. Go ahead and use you don't know what you're doing? Okay, we're using, okay, we're gonna listen to you. All right, thank you. <laughs> That's really mature of you to say. Thank you, Jesse. Um, <laughs> so we know that stormwater everywhere is contributing to this problem. It is a universal, universally challenging thing to think about. We haven't, this isn't the first time we've achieved this, we've, or we've landed in this place. Uh, we heard earlier from Ecology and some other folks about the problem of raw sewage entering our waterways 50 years ago. Oh my God, we don't have any treatment plants anywhere. <laughs> what do we do? How do we get down to zero? PCBs, wait, people have to stop doing that? Oh my God, that's so huge. What do we do? Things that just turn off when you're in the middle of a screen, what do we do? Um, so these are challenges that we've overcome over, over a long time. Tires aren't just here either. So like PCBs, like HCFCs leading the hole in the ozone layer, like climate change, there's tires in roads, there's tires in roofs, there's tires in dump sites. We thought it was a good idea to make artificial reefs out of tires and put them in the water. These are all leading to problems and it's massively huge, but we've been there before. And what we did is we said, what do we need to do as a society? Let's make a plan to get there. Let's make a plan to get there together. Tires are, are used in, in fields. We're seeing that there might be some human impacts of this. There's a, a problem with setting the frame of the goal of the success here. What is the success mission? So from the State of the Salmon and Watersheds Executive Summary, as you can read if it was on the screen, um, you know, the governor's office said that the, the discoveries coupled here with effective stormwater requirements will protect salmon in cities. Couple issues with that, we need to protect salmon more than in just cities. Cities are part of the problem, but sprawl is everywhere. There's roads everywhere, there's tires everywhere. But coupled with effective stormwater requirements, that is the entirety of the question that presents us today. What is effective stormwater? What is, what is an effective stormwater requirement? And a requirement is a baseline. It's something that we're working towards. And every single one of your amazing success stories that you're hoping to get done, that you've already gotten done, that you told the group about today, Upstream of you might be a jurisdiction or an area or a discharge point or a turn in a creek or a low water point or a place where salmon usually go to spawn that didn't do one of those. So this isn't something where we can just claim success in our little corner of the watershed and move on. This is a this is an entire watershed, whole ecosystem based need and challenge in front of us. And so therein lies effective stormwater management. How do we make sure that everyone is on the same trajectory to where we're going and where we need to be? I'll be the first to admit there are a lot of complexities. Here's some of them that go towards fixing this problem. Redevelopment, money, cost, street sweeping. Does it work? Does it not? Loopholes for certain other entities, that kind of thing. But we have a challenge in front of us. It's a binomial one, which I think means, since I stopped being a scientist a long time ago, uh, two options in front of us right now. We can have fish that die before they spawn or fish that have spawned and then they die through the natural course of ecosystem um, you know, processes. And in one of those where we have goals and plans and that's what we call effective stormwater management, then we will have conversations like we've heard some people allude to today where some streams are the ones that are saved, where there are some subwatersheds that get these investments and others won't because we don't have the money to or there's no requirements to get there where we'll have year to year funding uncertainty. We don't know if there's gonna be another pandemic or an inflation spike or another so-and-so in the White House. And that leads to uncertainty, which for all of you know, is difficult for long-term capital planning. And that will lead to continued ecological failure and our failure to live you know, in harmony with nature, which we absolutely can do. The alternative is to put in place the requirements on the floor the same way we've done with every emerging contaminant and problem over history, which is to move towards this whole watershed solutioneering, figuring out what's needed, and then driving the policies and plans so that we have the funding needed to make sure that we have resilient ecosystems that help everybody. So that's my cue and the music, and I'm getting a high five. So thank you very much.